talk about how trail building has evolved and how the information available to hikers, whether from maps, guidebooks, or online, has evolved over time. So please welcome to the And they found a nice uh, soft grass to, uh, to hang out on. And 
we all know what happened with too much of that. Now here are the trails that uh, we ended up uh, you know, adding in by the 1930s. And uh, you can see there was quite a bit of, of additional construction. And I guess I should have you know, darkened the ones that were there in 19, 1890, and then you really would have seen the whole system pretty much as it, uh, as it now exists. Well, the trails weren't always all that well marked. And my father, at the age of 12, uh, started guiding from Bitterbrook Lodge in Key Valley, just down below where the garden is now. And uh, I always like to put, put his rate sheet up there, given what you pay for a, a guide today. But, uh, he would, he, he, uh, and he also, he would also say that if uh, he was guiding ladies and they came to a law and they had to step over, he was required to turn around and look the other way while they lifted their legs on the law. <laughs> Very polite job. So, uh, in 1922, uh, this was the uh, cover of uh, uh, the Bob Marshall Guide to the Adirondacks. And this is the map that accompanied his uh, guide. Very simple, but enough to get you going. And he uh, said this was the first of a series of publications to be issued from time to time. And uh, he deemed it worthy of permanent record in his banner. They noted that the author is a charter member and turning the manuscript over to the club as a contribution. They then noticed that the view ratings for marshals had not a standard set up by the club. Uh, it's always interesting, the marshals seem to have to rate pretty much everything. Uh, my father, uh, for one edition of the uh, High Peaks books, uh, or the 46 er books, uh, had did a poll to see if people changed the view ratings from what the marshals had, and there were quite a few, for instance, Giant Rock and Peak went way up because there was no longer any fire damage that you were looking at as there was in the 1920s. Well, the next book that came out was uh, written by a man named Walter O'Kane. He wrote many other books, uh, including a lot about indigenous uh, peoples, but he had found time to write one for the Adirondacks and the Green Mountains and the White Mountains. And this is the uh, title page of the book. Uh, included uh, 315 pages, about the same size as my guide book, and described 33 trails ranging from Marshall to Black Mountain, including 15 of the 4,000 footers. And Mr. O'Kane found that things were a whole lot different in 1928. The soil is moist. Even at higher altitudes, it is often a sponge so saturated with moisture that water is pressed out of it as you step upon it. And if the way leads at an angle and the clouds have spilled enough of their contents, a little stream that may claim the route that you would follow. I think we've all found that phenomenon in the fact of the Adirondacks. Well, here was the Adirondack Mountain Club's first guidebook, written by Cora Phelps, and the uh, map that came with it and showed the original proposed sections that Cora Phelps, even in the 1930s, realized the Adirondacks was a big place and that uh, it was going to take more than one guidebook to cover it. And ADK finally, in the 1980s came up with a series of six guidebooks, which eventually has since then its front to four, but still with more than just the just the high peaks guide. Here is a 1940s high peaks map. I don't know how you can actually see it, uh, but what's interesting is that it shows the main trail to Marcy from uh, the south. Uh, starts uh, at the uh, over by Lake Sanford and goes to the uh, west of Sanford Hill and then up through between Cliff and Redfield. This was the, known as the old Buckley Tote Road. And the trail had to start there because the you know, Toss House Club still controlled the uh, area around Upper Works. And they did not allow anyone to start hiking from, from there. And the uh, Indian Pass crossover trail from, that goes from Indian Pass, north of the Heads of Henderson, lead you over to the Clamby Brook Trail. That was a way that you would come in from the west and get to Mount Marcy without passing by the private land of the uh, Hogs Club. After World War II, they moved down to their current location and the works became the parking. The DEC also has uh, made an effort to uh, have the uh, uh, trails to Mount Marcy. Uh, they, uh, you know, put out these circulars periodically. Eventually, they changed them to trails in the high peaks to try to get people away from Marcy, but 
basic Google map. There is the map that pretty much directs everyone to, to Mount Morrissey. So the uh, Adirondacks are somewhat unique in having the color-coded uh, trail markers. Uh, when the system was first instituted, the blue markers were supposed to go north-south, the red markers were supposed to go east-west, and the yellow markers would be connecting trails. And this was based on the numbering system for the federal highway system that was being developed in the 1920s and 30s, where you had Route 9, is an odd number, it goes north-south. You have Route 20, uh, which is an even number, it goes east-west, and three-digit numbers where they're supposed to be connected. In reality, this system broke down almost immediately, and it became just trying to have different markers at each junction. So if you're, if you're following blue markers, do not assume that you're going east or west, I mean, north or south. Now, what kind of trails was this map showing? Well, this is one of the trails to Marcy from the K. Flickinger collection at uh, the uh, Adirondack Center at Union College. And as you can see, it was not exactly a, a uh, bridle path. Uh, another muddy section pretty well grown in as well as Kate Lickinger had. And I looked around and asked around online to see if anyone has a picture of what the bog just below Timberline on Marcy looked like before the first corduroy was put in. So that is the bog now with a nice boardwalk down the middle and green grass. When I first climbed Marcy in 1957, gas, uh, that was absolutely black mud and much wider uh, because of all the trampling that had been going on and this was one place where you didn't necessarily uh, walk through the center to keep the trail from widening because you couldn't walk through the center, you just sank right up to your hips. So we move on in the guidebooks. Uh, this is the first edition which was, uh, you know, uh, greater detail of the, of, uh, of the uh, Trails measured with a measuring wheel, surveyor's measuring wheel, and the distances were expressed with a hundredth of a mile. Not that anyone in the field could actually appreciate that, but the author was L. Morgan Porter, who was an uh, aircraft engineer from Crap the Aircraft in East Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, he knew that he had to be precise there, he didn't have to be quite so precise on the trail. But this is the garden to JBL with 500 words. You can see that at 0.03 miles, the trail crosses the first small brook and start climbing, moderating it to 0.30. And it, we always say the South Side Trail went left half a mile. No, it went left at 0.51. <laughs> the, uh, and uh, then he notes that later, uh, John's Brook is heard at 2.88 miles. That not necessarily a reliable uh, landmark because who knows whether it rained the night before and I believe we have one person in the audience for whom that would be no help at all. Anyway, sorry. Uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, so he, uh, he definitely described it like that and uh, the, uh, when I uh, decided I would like to be the, uh, the editor of the guidebook, I uh, submitted a 250-word version of the hike to John Plage, and the Publications Committee decided that was more appropriate than 500 words, and I've cut a few more words out in the succeeding uh, years as I've talked to hikers and gotten some sense of what landmarks are actually useful and which ones aren't. So this was the map that came with the uh, early editions of the uh, <coughs> high beach, no contours. This was the first ADK topo map of 1971. Uh, this was edited by my father. Uh, and you know that you have an original uh, 1971 edition because there was a lean-to shown two miles up the new, then new East Trail to uh, uh, Rocky Peak and Giant. He was assured the fall before that the lean-to would be built the next spring and that map came out. Well, it didn't happen. And that was a lesson for me to try not to get ahead and put things on the map or in the guidebook until they actually happened rather than when they were proposed to happen. We've been going around on that with the Cascade Trail ever since. Uh, so what do the trails look like 
not in 1940, but here in 1970. Uh, not too much improvement between 1940 and 1974. This was a trail, the Slant Rock Trail, uh, about uh, probably half a mile below the uh, junction between Marcy and Haystack. I took this in 74 when I was an 80K ridge runner. This is another picture I took in 1974. Uh, I took it to demonstrate that, well, where you did put in a good bog bridge, grass would grow around. As soon as the bog bridge ended, the mud started. And that obviously there was a need for more good work like that. Well, bog bridges. This is one kind where you just take a log and shape it until it's got some flat on the top and uh, nail it securely and let the people walk on it. Uh, finished product of regular bog bridges, and these are up at Elk Pass. Well, this is the lumber that was dropped for Marcy Swamp renovation uh, in 2014, 2015. Uh, 1,600 linear feet of uh, pressure-treated planking was needed to uh, redo it. It happened that that was a project that I took on in 1979 when I was the chief of the uh, 80K trail crew. Uh, we were working with cedar half logs that lasted pretty well, but by you know, 20, you know, 2010 or so, it was obvious that there were no longer enough solid pieces that we could nail to, and we needed to get something else. When I did that in 1979, I never dreamed that I would be in charge of replacing the cedar half box. This is pressure treated three inches thick. I am quite sure I will not be in charge of replacing this one. <laughs> of course, the DDC managed to drop the cedar half logs half a mile. They did a little better, half a mile away from the trail. They did a little better, it was only a third of a mile away from the trail this time. And this was the Student Conservation Association crew that came in and spent 10 days and managed to haul about half of the uh, material out to the trail. They were troopers because this is what the haul trail looked like, basically. And that was in the fall. It got worse in the spring. And <laughs> what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> The crew had been working in Marcy Swamp for one week. It rained all weekend. When we came back, the uh, trail was, was flooded. And, uh, and you could, as you can see, we could paddle right up the Oak Lake Marcy Trail from the inlet. And no work was done that day or the next day until the water went down. It was, however, obstructed because I knew the bridges could float away. And this actually was this uh, girl on the crew who was making the two foot long stakes. And I said, Kelly, you really need to make those longer. Well, the water went down, the bridges had floated away, and she spent the rest of the time making five foot long, and they had not floated away. So thank you, Kelly. And here is what it was like. For much of that two, three weeks, three and a half weeks that they were working, uh, it was in the rain, uh, hauling material like this, and uh, yet they carried on and finished the 1,600 feet. Here's the, uh, the victorious crew in the back of Moonrise uh, <coughs> uh, By the last week, the last three days, there were three members of the DEC crew that uh, joined us uh, to, uh, to help finish up. And uh, as you can see, everybody was pleased that the, the job was done. And that's the finished product. That's ready to be in the distance if you're, if you're curious. Okay, another solution for wet areas is step stones. This is a line of less than expertly placed step stones, but I uh, show it as an example of the fact that it's not easy to make step stones in the Adirondacks with rocks that aren't particularly noted for having flat sides. And also, there are very different sizes. You get a whole line of rocks that's flat on top, the right distance apart, and all at the same height is uh, harder than one might think. Here's a slightly better section of, uh, of step stones. And then we can go to gravel turnpike, which is very labor intensive, but it produces a nice smooth uh, surface, especially if you don't happen to have a lot of good rocks around, but you have a good source of gravel. Okay, the other big danger for Adirondack trails, erosion. This is the tabletop bird bath. 
with the uh, 20 or so years of no drainage at all on a steep and somewhat popular trail. Another example of what that trail looks like. So we first of all started putting in wooden water bars. And for the first uh, uh, you know, many years, uh, that was the standard, just a wooden water bar. But of course, they don't last very long. And so that has now been replaced uh, by a line of rocks that makes a rock water bar. This is on the, uh, the Noonmark Trail that ATIS uh, worked on for many summers to uh, try to harden it all the way up to as, as close to the summit as, as we could. Another example of a water bar with rocks you know, basically set down there to try to make sure that the hikers stay on the trail, step over the water bar, and don't walk around it. Here's a more elaborate set of uh, step stones with a big ditch next to it. When I mean, you can't get the water away from the trail immediately, sometimes you have to lean it down next to the trail for uh, some distance before it can be exited off the trail uh, onto lower ground. Okay, now we have a steep eroded section, which you know, really can't be bypassed, and it's too late to uh, divert the water. So we need to have a rock staircase. Here is a simple rock staircase. The uh, technique is as old as the Romans. They built their roads out of rocks, and it basically is a cone-shaped hole to set the rock in, so it's resting on just three points. Uh, if you ever tried to shorten the legs of a table, you almost never can get them level. If you have just three legs, it's pretty easy to get them level. And that's the secret of just three points of contact, and then the next rock sits on top of it and pins it, and the next rock sits on top of it. Pretty soon, the entire weight of the staircase is collectively holding that staircase together. Here is a good example of a rock staircase with good screen on the lead-in to it so that uh, the hikers will indeed use it even though that first step That first step may look a little bit dauntingly high for some hikers, so that if there's any way they can not take that step, they'll, they'll choose to not take it. And uh, there's many examples on the current Cascade hiking trail where the first step has become so high that people will do anything not to have to use the staircase. Here's another more elaborate staircase leading up to a, uh, uh, a wooden staircase on the uh, Gilbert uh, Trail up uh, Indian Head. But where do these rocks come from? Well, you go out there in the woods and you find them, you hope. And they aren't always just lying around. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of uh, probing around with a crowbar until you finally hit something that seems like it might be big enough. And then you excavate. And when you finally get it out, oh, I think this might be a little bit too big. Oops, well, we'll try again. Maybe we can find a new sport, maybe we can. But that is the frustration of, of trail work. And I uh, once talked to uh, uh, a younger woman who was coming down off the pole in the first year of the ADK trail group. And I said, well, what was the interview process like? They said they had three questions. What's the most tired you've ever been? What's the dirtiest you've ever been? And what's the most frustrated you've ever been? I said, those are three very good questions to ask. So how do you move them? Well, uh, this obviously is not a really large rock, but it demonstrates the fact that you grab it like that and then push with your leg so that your back is pushing straight. You're not lifting it. You're not putting the strain on your back. You're putting the strain on your legs. And this next one is just simply the cutest trail for picture I ever had. <laughs> Teamwork, you know? So, if we get tired of rolling the rocks around or carrying them in one way or another, the next step up is the high line. And this is a setup that uh, was on Mount Katahdin where they were building steps and defined rocks. They then had to put the rocks in that basket which had uh, handles on it like a litter and carry it, you know, sometimes hundreds of yards in a circuitous route so that the trail workers weren't also damaging the vegetation. 
And then finally they decided to get an aluminum tripod up there, stretch a cable between the two uh, uh, tripods, and uh, just slide the rocks back. And that speeded things up considerably. And then, well, if you've got trees, you don't need a tripod. So here is the system. And you see the, uh, the keys. That's the winch, and that winch uh, will lower the cable so that it comes down on the ground. You can attach the rock to the pulley on the cable, and then you tighten the winch up and slide it to where you want it to go, and then you lower it again. And the, uh, this is the, the, the grip hoist winch, which is the standard for trail crews now. And notice that the cable just goes straight through. It doesn't go up on a drum like a normal uh, come along. And so you could pull an infinite length of cable through the, uh, the, the, the unit. And the lever right now is on the lever that pulls the cable in. You put the lever on the other handle and you can back off. And it backs off much more easily than any uh, come along where you have to uh, do a whole series of maneuvers for each little click that you, you get uh, off. So that is really the unit. There's several different shapes of it, but that's the basic, the basic tool that every trail crew uh, doing heavy work uh, uses now. So here is a high line in action on the Rooster Cone Trail. And here is the, uh, here's the good job on that day anyway. Just standing up in the woods and hauling it in and then waiting and then loosening it and then hauling it in again and loosening it, whatever. But I can assure you the trail crew does uh, tend to rotate the uh, jobs around. So this young lady was going to get a chance to get those nice white paints dirty by the end of the day. <laughs> if you're lucky, you'll be able to lower the rock pretty much right into where you need it. Uh, this one had to be moved just a little bit to one side. And there it goes, right into the hole. Uh, this was on the uh, Gilbrook Trail just down below the uh, Colvin Nipple Top Junction. You can also use it for uh, setting bridge stringers, and uh, this was on the Deerbrook Trail uh, going up snow. Now, here's the problem with one of those rock staircases. As I mentioned, people will try to go around them. The light on this is not particularly good, but this is, this is the herd path, the bootleg path is developed right next to the, uh, was developed right next to the, uh, Staircase. Okay, so we can put a lot of brush here, which will last for a while. And it's just amazing how persistent hikers can be in taking brush out of the way. I think that makes it easier to group. So the solution is just to sort of corral it at the beginning with rocks or whatever. You make sure that no one even thinks about going elsewhere. Now, why is this mentality? Well, this is this happens to be the back porch of the Osable Club with a handicapped access ramp next to the staircase. If you were to sit there for a while and count, you would probably find that the vast majority of people walked up the handicapped access ramp rather than took the stairs, even though it's the exact same rise that they have to uh, accomplish, but to get up on the porch. So the trail workers have to keep in mind some human psychology as well as the techniques. Uh, we can move on now to make it even steeper, our basic uh, ladder with, uh, with rungs. If it's not quite so steep, it's better to have the uh, uh, stairs rather than rungs because people don't really like to crawl at about, about a 45 degree slope. And if it's just ring, rungs, they won't step on it. And here's the nth degree of the, uh, of the staircases. Or the brook trail on up to Gothic's Notch. And I can't remember exactly how many steps there were, and I didn't count them. Uh, similar staircases have been built on the south side of Poland, and I think there's about seven or eight hundred wooden steps, and they still hadn't gotten all the way up to the uh, up to Timberline. And this is a technique that, uh, that I uh, have worked on is to put pin steps. 
uh, we have sort of put an extra ladder to see what would be uh, you know, useful when people choose the ladder, but they choose the, uh, the pin steps, and they ended up using the pin steps. So we then have taken, since taken the ladder down. The technique is to drill two holes straight down to the rock, put some half inch uh, steel pins coming up, and then mark the bottom of the wooden step, drill a hole that's just slightly smaller than the, uh, the pin, and then hammer the, uh, the wooden step down onto that pin. And that is pretty much guaranteed to stay there. Uh, I do enjoy whenever I'm asked how those are held on, to simply look absolutely straight-faced and say, gorilla glue. <laughs> See how long it takes them to realize that I'm probably not telling the truth. OK, here's a place that would require an amazing amount of work. Uh, fortunately, this is on the Ridge Trail and we were able to bypass this with some series of switchbacks. Uh, this is about, oh, half a mile above the, uh, the washbowl, just below the first view above the washbowl. And here is the trail under construction. My dog is testing it out very carefully. Here's another view. It doesn't look quite that good today, after 10 years or 12 years of use, but it's definitely, uh, there's definitely been a whole lot of improvement uh, from the, uh, from what you see, it's the same, same basic view uh, today. And you can see some of the same trees are here. Uh, so uh, it does show that in the Adirondacks, at least uh, 10 years uh, is enough to start the significantly healing damage done by a trail that was, uh, was poorly constructed and maintained. And now we'll go back to another improvement here on the left is the slant rock trail that I uh, showed earlier. And on the right is the same piece. The trees have grown up, or maybe I'm just a little bit lower, but you can still just barely see the uh, uh, big slide and yard. Uh, the same, that same uh, profile there indicating that it's pretty much the same section of trail. Significantly improved by some good work done by the Adirondack Mountain crew in the 1980s. And another one that uh, I uh, have here is uh, this one on the left is 1970. Uh, this was when everyone thought that the only reason the trails were in such bad shape was because there were so many more hikers in 1970 than there were in 1965. Uh, and here on the right is my son at age eight uh, in 1992, uh, walking down pretty much the same second. Again, the improvement should be should be obvious. So we are making progress, even if uh, it's if, even if it's slow. So I sort of go on to the nth degree of improved trails. And here is some sections or a section of the East Trail to Mount Van Hovenberg, which uh, has been very popular, and I'm glad to see that lots of people are using it because it obviously can stand up to that use. The technique which you don't appreciate when you're walking on it, is notice the line of boulders. I hit the wrong button every time. This line of boulders here. The first step is to build that up. And uh, I counted that it's about 1,800 boulders per mile. And it's just short of two miles. So there's, they set uh, well over 3,000 boulders on the lower side of the trail in order to construct this trail. And then the next step is to find crush, uh, smaller uh, cobbles, uh, which uh, are then filled back in. And that is, uh, makes for very good drainage. And then it is dressed up with, uh, dressed up with mineral soil, which is quarried on the pit. And I, uh, when they first started working on it, I saw this uh, pit uh, on the Mount Edelberg Trail and was talking to uh, Willie Janeway, some of you may know him, now is the director of the Adirondack Council, or soon to leave the Adirondack Council, but he was the one who came in as North Country Operations Director and really built up the uh, professional trail group to where it is today. He uh, and I were talking about this and I said, well, they were able to use machinery up until the wilderness boundary that was town of North Elba land. And he 
And he said, Tony, I think the machine got a little farther than that because did you see the size of some of those quarry pits? And I go, yep. And I went up, got my computer, and showed him this picture. And I said, that's how they were made. He was impressed. <laughs> you never thought that he'd get really through to dig a hole that deep, and that many of them. But anyway, while they're digging, any small little cobble is thrown aside to be used for that, uh, you know, for the backfill. Uh, but you don't always have enough of the, uh, uh, you don't always have enough. Now let's see if I can. I've uh, done some strange things on trail work in my day, but never anything like this. Anyway, the very first year of the Mount Manoeuvre Trail, they actually had prisoners doing good old prisoner work, turning big rocks into little rocks. And the, uh, I'm sure that the hiker was joking, but the girl that we saw shoveling down the pit there said she was asked by one hiker what she was in for. <laughs> anyway, here is probably the most elaborate of the many staircases on the Mount Manoeuvre. East Trail. Uh, I, I hiked it last fall and I counted 742 rock steps on the 1.9 miles, 1, 1 miles of trail. Major effort. And so here is the ultimate plan uh, for the uh, Cascade and Van Hovenberg trails. This is the East Trail of Van Hovenberg, which has already been constructed. This is the Cascade Trail. This part was finished uh, this past year to connect to this section here that was done in 2019. This little bit extra is what was completed uh, this year, starting in about the middle of July. This is the unfinished portion that we still have to go. And it ends there in the call between Porter and Cascade. And at the moment, it doesn't appear there's any plan to do any work to uh, improve the trails from there to the summit of either Porter or Cascade. Uh, so, and the, uh, the question is, with the amount of progress they made last year, when will the rest of it? Because this is an example of the hardest group, hardest section of construction on Mount Van Hovenberg, which they did manage to finally uh, push through several hundred yards and it took them three weeks. This is what it looked like. You can believe it. Should probably have those, you know, next to each other. But anyway, they managed to detain that. But here is some of the terrain that they still have to go on Porter. And here is uh, one section where they pretty much the top of what they managed to finish by the middle of October this past year. Uh, and uh, it's amazing that they were to do as much as they, they were to uh, finish this off. Uh, I had another picture, I probably should have included that, uh, of a rock uh, probably about three feet high that they were drilling into and then chipping off big chunks to make these, to make these, uh, uh, to make the blocks there because by drilling, they end up getting, getting a piece of rock that's guaranteed to have at least one good flat side, if not maybe two or three easier to, uh, to set them. And uh, I showed the picture of this three foot high, you know, two foot square on the top rock to a friend. And, and she said, that looks like a job for the Flintstones. Yabba dabba do. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, they had managed to produce that rock to pieces, but hadn't managed to build much more trail. And I always like to finish with this picture. It's a postcard that was labeled at Adirondack Trail. And if they could all look like that, wouldn't we be happy? So we can all dream, right? Let's we're gonna go home and dream of Adirondack Trails. All look like that. So anyway, thank you very much. And
of the compatibility of turnpiking uh, trails in wilderness areas. Uh, that definitely is a, is a question as to, you know, how much of it. Uh, I was on the High Peak Citizens Advisory Committee in the early 90s, and I worked uh, with Willie Janeway and tried to come up with some formula of what the maximum allowable section length of turnpiking in a wilderness trail. And we came up with a description that, you know, classified uh, something like the Van Hoover Trail of Marcy as a class five trail. Uh, and went down from there to a class one, which basically was a fisherman's hat. And then we described a class six trail, which would be more like a front country trail at the Vic. And I gather the DEC still has that information. And I think that until they, they built the East Trail in Mount Van Hogenburg, all the other trails, the current bike fell well within the, the guidelines. Now, obviously, this is a whole new world, and uh, we, uh, we don't, that doesn't seem to have become a matter of, of, of concern. If it's going to build a trail that stands up to the use, uh, that seems to be, uh, overrides the, you know, the fact that it looks a little bit more civilized than it should. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess there would be some who would consider it to be inconsistent with the wilderness guidelines. Uh, all trail work, you know, heavy duty trail work now, when it is new, looks quite unnatural. It doesn't take that many years before you get some leaves, pine needles, and it begins to look like just a nice, smooth, but natural surface. And I think that will be the trajectory for these trails as well. So yes, initially it's going to look somewhat artificial, uh, but it will look less artificial. Uh, and uh, and for what it's worth, Peter Bauer likes it. Yes. Because people were going out onto the slide, and there was no uh, regrowth being uh, being allowed on the slide. That's what I understood. It wouldn't have been my choice, and that was really why I started experimenting with those pin steps, because I thought those was you know you know about one tenth as much unnatural material in the wilderness area. Uh, than those long staircases with the stringers and the wide steps. The debate there is whether you want to allow the stairs or the forest. Yes, right. But the uh, the problem with any kind of a switchback at that elevation in the Adirondacks is you're working with a foot, maybe a foot and a half of organic soil sitting on absolutely smooth bedrock. You take it across the hillside and it's going to slide off unless you put in some artificial tread, uh, you know, of one kind or another, whether it's pin steps or whether it's a structure like that. So, you know, Adirondack Trail work, uh, those who have been on other trail crews in other mountain areas and they come here, they all agree that doing trail work in the Adirondacks is more challenging than anywhere else. No, I, my reaction to that was to say that there's got to be a better way of doing it. And but they're definitely well aware of it now. And I've been, you know, I and the current 80, 80 ATS trail crew chief have been pushing to get the DEC to really accept this as an acceptable alternative. Because there's so many places where just two or three of those pin steps would take care of a little rise that now people are going way out and around. You know, and it wouldn't, and it, you know, we don't know exactly how long those would last, but they certainly, you know, it's a big eight by eight chunk of pressure treated. Uh, it should last a, a lot longer than any of those ladders.
you know, certainly uh, in mountain areas, but these trails as they are now, give the Adirondacks its character. Well, some people have, have also said that, but you know, you're definitely saying, let's correct the drainage, let's correct the wet areas, and that's to be the, the two most important things that, uh, that can be done, is to get water off the trail and to uh, uh, you know, make sure that the boggy areas have got good solid tread in them so people don't have to keep going around uh, and making them, them wider. And uh, you know, the, uh, the, the new trails that, uh, that at ATIS is built, for instance, the Rooster Cone Trail, that was pretty much, you know, you know, we didn't gravel it, we didn't put up a hole in the steps, we just dug it with side hills so there's good natural drainage, and it was rooted so that it didn't go across any logs except at the very beginning, uh, when we had no choice to get from the Rooster Cone parking lot over to the, to the solid ground. And uh, so I, you know, question whether, you know, we need to have any more trails like Mount Van Hovenberg, but uh, my observation, you know, of the use of that trail just in its first year is that it is it is meeting the need you know meeting a need uh, you've got ample parking you've got good facilities at the start and the ADK uh, Cascade Welcome Center people said it was ideal because there were so many people who came in there and they could simply direct them to go one mile further down the road turn right into Mount Van Hovenberg you'll have a nice four mile round trip to a great view and they were putting them onto a, a trail that was uh, sustainable. I, of course, wondered, you know, do we really need to have wilderness areas that come right out of the highways? But I can't change that. Probably not. Yeah. So is the Van Holtenberg Trail uh, going to be the new Cascade Border Trail, or in part, or what's the story of Okay, the, the, the question is, will the new Cascade Trail start the same as the Mount Van Holtenberg Trail? Yes. Yeah, the first nine tenths of a mile, uh, the two trails are the same. And then where the new east trail to Mount Van Hovenberg takes a sharp right and starts climbing again, the Cascade Trail will go straight. And if you're if you're curious, go to that turn, follow a you know, sort of obvious herd path for a hundred yards or less, and you'll come across the finished section that will take you all the way to the end of the of the current construction. Uh, no, if, if the new one is finally completed, it will be uh, five and a half miles as opposed to 2.4 miles to get a cascade. And you will also climb and descend 300 feet before you start the final climb. So you'll have 300 feet to regain on the way back. Uphill both ways. Because they like the park is not an over. I was against it right from the beginning. I'll come right out and say that. I, I did not think it was a good idea. I wrote seven pages of comments on the latest amendment to the high peak unit management plan. On page one, I said this new trail will not work. But that was my statement. 